that kindness to kids will be um, administered through the uh, Hatfield Elementary School. Anyone who is on the subsidized lunch program uh, will be able to apply for this. They, if they slide through the cracks, like if somebody needs a pair of eyeglasses in the winter, somebody needs a, a pair of boots, maybe a winter coat, uh, we'll be able to help them as we are able. And so thank you very much for your generosity for all of that. I do want to mention uh, that up here, if you can't see them, is our handbell quartet, and they will be joining in with uh, the choir for some of their musical selections today. We thank them very much for being with us here today. And also, the final thing I want to mention is that our prelude for this morning's worship is all glory, laud, and honor. <coughs> Uh, 
uh, so that I could get up and uh, be chipper and everything else and come down here. And if you get up at 4.45, it's pitch black and it's just like the middle of the night. So I figured what I would do is I would set the alarm for like 3 in the morning and then wait for Sharon to get up, head off to the bathroom, get all ready and all that kind of stuff. But she's a lot smarter than I give her credit for because she said, there's no way it's morning. And she just rolled over and went to bed. I would ask you now to uh, please turn to your bulletins, and we will begin with our call to worship. This is a great and joyous festival day. Come to celebrate the amazing news. Alleluia. Sing songs of praise for God is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. Alleluia. Now I say to our prayers for salvation. Jesus Christ is risen, and we shall live. Open your hearts and minds to the risen Christ. You are greeted by name and welcome here. Alleluia. Praise be to God. Amen. Alleluia. May we now join together in our unison prayer. We greet the dawning brightness of this special day with hopes renewed. We have known grief and sorrow, loss and tears, fear and failure. But now we need the risen Christ in our worship. Here we celebrate his healing presence. We rejoice in the fact that Jesus' tomb was found empty. He is not dead. He lives among us now. The resurrection is God's testimony that Jesus is the Son, the risen Savior of us all. With this glorious announcement as the foundation of our faith, we gather now as a people filled with faith and hope. Amen. Hallelujah. And please now join in the singing from Blue Hymnal number 216, Christ the Lord is risen today. Thank you.
Alzheimer's. I'd like to begin with a prayer uh, for Amy Benson, uh, who is diagnosed with blood clots in her lungs and in her legs. And this is offered by her mother-in-law, Carol Benson. Also, prayers for the health of a friend of mine from Deerfield who is recovering from pneumonia um, down in Florida, but trying to encourage his daughters to come back up here in Massachusetts. And prayers for two dear ladies who are struggling with cancer and also with its treatments. Also, prayers for Jean Sheehan, who is recovering from surgery in Florida. Prayers for Jenny Belden, who will have surgery on her back on Tuesday. Prayers for Katie Pepin and Russ Pomeroy, as offered by Mary McCarthy. Also, prayers for a friend who had to terminate, terminate her pregnancy uh, just this past Thursday. Uh, for the child who was never born, and for the family that grieves. Also, Sharon's father, Henry Vyshevsky, passed away on April 2nd of 2003. Offer our prayers that he may rest in peace. And also, as we mentioned in the um, announcements at the beginning, uh, prayers in memory of the late Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., who was assassinated on Wednesday, 50 years ago at 7.01 p.m. He was a blessing to our nation, and we celebrate his life and also his eternal life. Are there any other joys, concerns, or celebrations that you would like to share from the pews? Yes. And his name was Kenny? Okay, so we'll keep, we'll keep, pray okay, we'll keep prayers for Kenny uh, on Tuesday. Any other prayers? Yes. Yeah, uh, 23 years ago today, we were surprised by the birth of our daughter. Um, very nice. Well, happy birthday. Happy birthday. All right. Any other prayer intentions, joys, celebrations, concerns? So then may we also take this opportunity in the middle of our public worship for just a few moments of silence to be with Jesus in the privacy of our own thought and our own souls and our own thoughts uh, to feel what he needs to say to us and what we can only say to him alone. tombs and abundant surprises, who proclaims new life even in the face of obvious death. Dry our tears of grief and calm the anguish in our lives as we again celebrate the amazing truth that Jesus is risen. Easter means that Jesus lives among us and is here now, so let us try to feel his presence. Let us trust in the hope that Easter shares with us and with all people. Let our prayers now brought to your holy assembly. May they be heard, and may they be answered. And please join me now in reciting the prayer that Jesus himself taught us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We consecrate all that we have brought to share, that the wondrous message of Easter may spread through the streets and across the lands, beginning within these walls and within each and every one of our hearts. May the glad songs and the good news of this most holy of days lead to practical ministries in the resurrected Savior's name. May all that we offer today express our unending thankfulness to such a God.
Jesus died. They went to the tomb expecting only death. Instead, they found the empty tomb and the promise of the resurrection. At that moment, everything changed, not only for Jesus, not only for believers, but the entire world. May these gifts help us to keep changing the world for the better in the image and likeness of our Savior, the one who has called us here today. Thank you for your gifts. Please join together now as we will sing Blue Hymnal number 218, Thine is the Glory.
Today's reading is Acts 10, 34 through 43. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is the Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John announced. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with the power. How he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. We are witness to all that he did, both in Judea and Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all people, but to us who were chosen by God as witness, and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And today's Easter Gospel is taken from the Gospel according to St. John. Early in the morning, on the first day of the week, while it was still dark out, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb. She saw that the stone had been moved away, so she ran off to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. And she told them, the Lord has been taken from the tomb, and we do not know where they have put his body. At that, Peter and the other disciples started out on their way toward the tomb. They were running side by side, but then the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He did not enter, but bent down to peer in and saw the wrappings lying on the ground. Presently, Simon Peter came along behind him and entered the tomb. He observed the wrappings on the ground and saw the piece of cloth which had covered the head, not lying with the wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the disciple who had arrived first, he also went in. He saw and he believed. Remember as yet that they did not understand the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. With this, the disciples went back home. Meanwhile, Mary stood weeping beside the tomb. Even as she wept, she stooped to peer inside, and there she saw two angels in dazzling robes. One was seated at the head and the other at the foot of the place where Jesus' body had once laid. Woman, they asked her, why are you weeping? She answered them, because the Lord has been taken away, and I do not know where they put his body. She had no sooner said this than she turned around and caught sight of Jesus standing there. But she did not recognize Jesus. Woman, he asked her, why are you weeping? Who is it that you are looking for? She supposed that Jesus was only the gardener. So she said, Sir, if you are the one who carried Jesus' body off, tell me where you have laid it, and I will take it away. But Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned to him and said in Hebrew, Rabboni, meaning teacher. And Jesus then said, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Rather, go to my brothers and tell them that I have ascended to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. And Mary Magdalene went to the disciples and said, I have seen the Lord. And then she reported that all that she had said and all that he had said to her. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And I know this is a really big day, um, but I don't know if it was, uh, you know, getting up too early or whatever, but um, my stomach is just a little bit upset, and so I'm going to sneak off for just a second, and um, I'll be back right away.
so hard any longer to convey the idea of surprise, of shock, of disbelief, of how in the world could this actually have taken place. That wasn't only an April Fool's Day joke. Just imagine being Mary or Peter or John or any of the unknown followers of Jesus. They went to that tomb expecting death. They saw the horrors of that cross. I don't know if any of you have been following on the, the Facebook post that went on during Lent, but they had a graphic description in Biblical Archaeological Review about what that cross means. You know, we wear it as jewelry. We adorn every church with crosses. But it was gross. It was disgusting. It was brutal. And it was a spectacle. And that cross was so much a part of that Roman society back then that it took about 400 years before any Christian church would actually display Jesus on the cross because it was just too gross. It was brutal. And so you can't really blame those people from 2,000 years ago who had actually seen what happened to Jesus. You can't blame them and say that, oh my gosh, their faith was so weak. How could they have seen all of the miracles of Jesus? How could they have watched him for all those years and not understood that he was really going to resurrect from the grave? They did not have a weak faith. They had a logical idea, the reality of death. I gotta grab that water. That was a long run. <laughs> so, when we talk about them going to the tomb on Easter, it really was not because they were faithless. They loved the man. They went there to finish the burial rites that could not be completed because the Passover had come as soon as sundown on Good Friday. They could not finish the burial rites for Jesus, so they went back to finish the burial rites. And they wanted to go in there and they wanted to take care of the body of Jesus. No one at that time had a resurrection faith. No one was expecting it. And you know, this morning, we had our sunrise service out here beyond this field over there. We had a sunrise service without sun. Uh, but we were out there anyway. And so we're out there, and it's right by the Colonial Cemetery. We're all people of faith. We're all people who believe in the resurrection. But I guarantee that not one of us would have been standing there and clapping if anybody started coming out of those graves from the Colonial Cemetery. We would have been scared to death. And you know, just take that logical disbelief, how hard it is to imagine that the person you saw not only dying, but executed and brutally executed. Just imagine how amazing that is to realize that he is not in that tomb anymore. So he didn't have, those people didn't have a weak faith. They just had a human faith, like any of us did. So transfer that kind of belief about, you know, the colonial cemetery and people coming out, transfer it back to them, and we can better understand where they're coming from. So Mary goes out to the tomb. She goes there and she sees that the stone from the entrance has been rolled away. She doesn't even continue on her journey. Instead, she runs back to the disciples and says, they've taken his body and we don't know where it is. Wasn't it enough that they killed him? Now they're going to desecrate his body? We don't know where they have laid his body. So back in 2,000 years ago, a woman's word was not really counted as much. So John and Peter, they run to the tomb also to see what in the world this woman is talking about. Is she merely hysterical or what's going on? So they go to the tomb. John is the youngest one. He gets to the tomb first. He peeks inside, but he's not brave enough to go into the grave. Instead, Peter, the rather rambunctious one, he gets there eventually, huffing and puffing like I just did. He goes into the grave. He looks all around. John comes in. They look all around. And the Bible says, as of yet, they did not understand the scriptures that Jesus must die. And what did they do after they saw the empty grave? The Bible is very poetic at this point, very powerful. It's an amazing story. They went home. They saw the empty grave. And they went home. They didn't start preaching. They didn't start proclaiming the resurrection. They went home. And the story stops for them at that point. Now Mary had followed along behind both of these guys. And so she's still outside the tomb sobbing because she does not know where the body is. And so the other two have gone home. Mary Magdalene is there at the tomb crying. Somebody taps her on the shoulder. 
She turns around. She cannot recognize Jesus. There's, it's a resurrected body. It's a different body, but there's also not that, that readiness in Mary to say, oh, that's Jesus, because he's dead. He, she's looking for the body. And so when Jesus taps her on the shoulder, she says, he says, why are you crying? And she thinks he's the gardener for that garden of Gethsemane. She says, have you taken the body? If you've got the body, show me where it is, and I'll take care of it. I won't get in trouble, I promise. And then she, Jesus merely says, her name. And as soon as Jesus says her name, Mary, all of that old relationship comes flooding back to Mary, and Mary recognizes Jesus. But she wasn't ready at that point, up until that point, because she thought Jesus was still just the gardener. And that whole story of shock and disbelief and refusal to believe, all of that is intention. And it's told in all four of the Gospels. Every one of the Gospels is different, but all that mystery, that this was a shocking event. The most shocking of all is in Mark's gospel, the oldest gospel. The women are so flustered that they run away in fear and the gospel stops. No one ever hears about Easter. Mark is trying to tell the first generation of Christians that you have to experience it yourself. I can't tell it to you. You have to experience Easter yourself because it is such a shock, it is such a revelation that none of you is prepared unless you have him here. It's not about history. It's about mystery. But then, something amazing happens. Something absolutely miraculous happens. We're here. Half a world away, 2,000 years later, we're still celebrating Easter to the point where it's not even a surprise and I have to run all the way around to try and make a surprise again. Because how in the world did that happen? Everybody had abandoned Jesus. He had no one. And that's the intentional message of that gospel because even the ones who did not believe in Jesus, even the ones who would not come to believe in Jesus, they accepted that the tomb was empty. They didn't doubt it. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't discount it. Not because if, it, if there had been a body of Jesus in the tomb, they could have dragged it out as soon as those Christians started talking about the resurrection. They could have said, yeah, you want to see Jesus? Here's his body. Look, here's the, where the nails went. Here's where we went. They couldn't do that because there was no body in the tomb. So then the next story is, well, the disciples stole his body and they put it somewhere else so they could tell this fantastic story of the resurrection. But that's the problem. These people were not yet prepared to be able to tell a story of the resurrection. They may have been able to fool others if they went out and stole the body, but they could not have fooled themselves Mary was not in a position to fool herself. Peter was not in a position to fool himself. John was not in a position to fool himself. If they could not fool themselves, then they couldn't have stolen that body and gone off and told others about it because somehow Mary became the first apostle. She became the first one to tell others about the resurrected Christ. Peter and John, like you heard today in the lesson, they go out and they publicly and courageously they proclaim Jesus resurrected. He is the Lord. He's the Savior. And when you use those words, you're taking on Caesar. You're taking on the temple. You're taking on anybody at all. And they don't care because they know that the tomb was empty. They couldn't have done that unless something happened. What happened? The tomb was empty. Jesus really, really resurrected. This is not just trying to fool people 2,000 years later. This is their story from 2,000 years ago. And if Jesus was not there, if the tomb was really empty, and if they didn't steal the body, because how in the world could they have played the mental, psychological trick to be able to do that? If that tomb was empty, if Jesus was not there, that means he's here. Right now, with each and every one of us. Easter's not looking to the past. Easter's looking here. Where is Jesus now in our lives? It's about finding him again. You know, Easter, that sunrise service, it's about looking to the horizon. It's about looking to the new day. It's about looking forward. It's about looking to the new things that God can do in us for a crucified Savior, a resurrected Savior. What are we going to do now that we really believe? Because you're here. You know, you're here, you believe in Easter. What are we going to do now that we really believe in Easter? 
You know, those first guys, they went home after seeing the empty tomb. Mary stayed out of the tomb sobbing, but something changed them. What's going to change us now that we really believe in the empty tomb? How are we going to be different? How is this church going to be different? What is Easter going to mean? You know, we, a lot of people can say, if I was back then, I would have believed. I've heard that a thousand times. Well, you weren't back then. You're right now, and Jesus is real right here. What are we going to do to prove that we really believe? What are we going to do to believe that when we have communion, that Jesus comes to us? When we hear the word, that Jesus comes to us? That when we come here, that Jesus comes to us? You know, I really believe that Jesus is here. But without this, without Jesus coming amongst all of us, I don't think this is strong enough to go out there and survive. It's a scary world. In a place even like Hatfield, you've had a drug assassination down the road. You know, that's a little tiny New England town with a drug assassination down the road. It's a mean world, and it's not going to go away. That bit of Jesus in us, that resurrection faith, it needs this oasis. It needs this time outside the tomb where Jesus taps us on the shoulder and says, each of our names, Mary for Mary, Randy for Randy, and all of your names for each of you. And when he says those names, we have to be changed. Amen, kid. Amen. <laughs> so may that, may that change take place in all of us. May Easter fill us with joy and hope and peace. And may it change us enough so we can change the world. In Jesus' resurrected name we pray. Amen. I believe in all of your bulletins you have a handout for the sacrament of communion if you can take that out at this point who wish to know the presence of Christ and to share in the community of all God's people. The Gospel tells us that on the first day of the week, Jesus was raised from death, appeared to Mary Magdalene, on that same day sat at the table with two disciples, was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. <laughs> For this table is for all people who wish to know the presence of Christ and to share in the community of God's people. God be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to God. Let us give thanks to God most high. We We give you thanks, God of majesty and mercy, for the beauty and the bounty of the earth and for the vision of the day when sharing by all will mean scarcity for none. We rejoice that you call the entire human family to this table of sacrifice and love. We come in remembrance and celebration of the gift of Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be the good news. Born of Mary, our sister in faith, Christ lived among us to reveal the light and the life of your grace, to suffer on the cross for each of us, to be raised from death, and then to live in glory. We bless you, gracious God, for the presence of your Holy Spirit in the church among us. With your daughters and sons of faith, in all times and all places, we praise you with joy. Holy, holy, holy God of love and majesty, the whole universe speaks of your glory. O God most high, blessed is the one who comes in the name of our God, of the Son and the highest. We remember that on the night of his betrayal and desertion, that Jesus took bread, gave you thanks, broke the bread, and gave it to the disciples, saying, This is my body that is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
ministering to you in Christ's name, I share with you the bread. In the same way, Jesus also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Ministering to you in Christ's name, I share with you the cup. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the gift of our Savior's presence in the simplicity and the splendor of this holy meal. Unite us with all who are fed by Christ's body and blood we may faithfully proclaim the good news of your love and that your universal church may be a rainbow of hope in an uncertain world. 
Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Please join now in Blue Hymnal number 224, Christ Arose. <laughs> Victory. 
dare to live the hope-filled message that the tomb really was empty, that really Jesus is risen. <laughs> that death is defeated, and that Christ is Lord. Hallelujah.